Good morning, everybody. It's Betty. I, uh, I've been wanting to share about the 10-day silent meditation that I went through uh, about a week ago, and I thought that I would just wait until Saturday because there's been a lot this week that have gone on, and um, I think it's uh, important to kind of not just share what I learned, but also uh, how I've been utilizing some of the learnings and some of the lessons that I got. So um, I'm here in my home and it's Saturday morning. Uh, it's right before I cook a nice breakfast for my daughter. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, uh, Vipassana, silent meditation. And this is something that I actually went through. And, uh, and I went through it as a result of uh, uh, very big advice that Juan Carlos gave me and uh, I've seen a lot of uh, different things and I thought okay I'm gonna go so let me walk you through what this silent meditation was about uh, when we got there uh, they they gave us some promises that we had to make and in uh, in Afterwards, they would explain why these promises and these things that we did uh, happened. So, uh, and I'm reading from the little booklet. Um, to abstain from killing any being, to abstain from stealing, to abstain from all sexual activity, uh, abstain from telling lies, abstain from all intoxicants. And then in addition to that, to abstain from sensual entertainment and body decoration. Later on, I found out that the main reason for that was to have a clean body and to start this whole process with a clean body, um, clean body and then clean mind. So we'll talk a little bit about that. The first three days was spent on clearing your mind. And if you think about, <laughs> I think, a hundred different directions uh, at a hundred miles an hour usually. And so clearing my mind was uh, difficult. It wasn't easy. Uh, but they used my your normal breath to be able to do that. It took three days to the point where I finally was able to just sit down and enjoy a cup of tea and not have my mind just go all over the map. Uh, at first, uh, it was difficult to sit for a length of time. We would sit for about an hour at a time and then have a five minute break and then come back and sit. There were teachings every day. We were not able to speak um, to one another. We could only speak to the teacher a couple of times, about five minutes, if we had any questions and so forth. So we went through that for the first three days. Uh, after the first three days, my mind was nice and calm and I was able to sit. But in the first three days, they, they had us actually focus on our natural breath. And uh, so as, as we would, as the days went by, I could actually feel the breath, that the cold breath coming in and the warm breath coming out. And then I st they started focusing us on this area and really focusing in. And the idea was the, the, the smaller the area you focus on, the sharper your mind is. And so what I found later and what I'm finding after the fact is the idea is to get your mind really, really sharp. And so you're able, hey Betty, hey Mike. Um, and uh, so that you're able to really focus your mind in the, the smaller the area that you can focus on, the sharper your mind is. And I'm finding uh, this week as I was going through meetings that the meetings were shorter. I was able to get even more laser-like focused with my people and so forth. So, hi baby. Um, that's my cousin Mike. And so, uh, so then afterwards, uh, they started focusing us on a smaller area and it was just from the tip of the nose down to, to the top of the lips and then this tiny little area here and really focusing in on the breath only in this area. So again, the smaller the area, the sharper your brain is, the sharper your brain becomes. So we're training the brain to really become very laser-like focused. All of a sudden, I started feeling some tingling right here. And the what, what I was taught was, your body is, of course, made up of cells. 
and the sales vibrate. So the tingling that I started feeling here were the actual sales that were vibrating. And so all of a sudden I started to feel the tingling all over, like all over my head and then all over my arms and down my, my legs. And that those are the cells. Your brain becomes so sharp that you can begin to feel the cells in your body actually vibrating. And that was absolutely amazing. But, but anyway, so I'm getting ahead of myself. On the fourth day is when we actually started Vipassana, which is when you start feeling the sensations in your body. And the focus of the sensations was um, uh, you want to focus on three different things, two different things, craving and aversion. And so by sitting there, and I'll explain that in just a little bit. So by sitting there for a long time, we would start feeling these these cells vibrating and and actually start to crave it because it felt so good and and then the pain you know when you feel pain in your body or when you have a really tough situation or somebody that yells at you you really don't want to get together with them or, or maybe you evade them and so um, aversion is something that they wanted to teach us to not um, have and um, and so pay attention to the craving and aversion while you are taking a look at your body so I felt the pain and then at the moment I felt the pain like the pain in my back it was really interesting because uh, I, I felt like oh this is feeling really hard and, and it hurts and the more I focused on the pain the bigger the pain got and so what they said is don't do that look at it objectively and uh, equanimity is a word and I'm gonna write this down because I keep um, uh, wanting to equanimity equanimity and it's spelled E Q U I N I M I T Y equanimity so if you look at that word in the dictionary uh, when you look at something with equanimity is you're looking at it objectively you're not doing judgment on it you're just looking at something objectively so when I felt the pain and they said look at the pain and look at it objectively don't really focus on it so that's what we did and so what happened was then uh, you start thinking about it with this framework in mind everything that comes goes so knowing that everything that comes and actually goes my mother used to say esto solamente es un pasoncito this is only a little step in life and she would say in here in north america we say this too shall pass and so for those of you i know there's some of you that are watching from europe also uh so this too shall pass is a saying here in north america so if you put that in your mind that everything that comes is going to go then all of a sudden the pain doesn't seem like it's going to be forever because it's never going to be forever there's nothing here that's forever even our own lives we're going to die someday so i looked at the pain and then all of a sudden on a scale of one to ten ten being highest pain a pain that was an eight all of a sudden became a two so hey Carlos good to see you uh, I'm just telling about my my uh, learnings from this 10-day Vipassana meditation which was absolutely amazing great lessons uh, so when you focus on this pain then all of a sudden when you look at it objectively it became uh, a very low pain it, it, it it's almost like like you can actually uh, stand it so that was really interesting and again everything that comes goes so then uh, then let's let's take a look at craving there was an instance and this was really interesting because not everybody felt this there were about 70 people in the class uh, half of them men and half of them women and they separated us we weren't able to even see each other they ate at different areas and I'll tell you about that in just a little bit so the craving all of a sudden I was feeling all of the cells in my body and I could feel not in my torso but I could feel them all over my head and they were vibrating I could literally feel them I couldn't believe it because your brain just becomes so laser like focused and so sharp and then there was this they call it ecstasy that comes and I'm gonna share something personal with you it was um, the feeling was almost like when you are 
being intimate with someone and right before you have an orgasm it was that that feeling it was like your your body was all of a sudden crescendo and crescendo and crescendo and this feeling almost like you just want to stay there they called it ecstasy and the, all that was was just the feeling in your body and so I went up to the teacher and I said okay I'm being equanimous which is again um, equanimity, uh, being able to observe the pain in my body and, and have it be uh, non judgmental. And so I'm doing really well. And, and then I've got this really great feeling and I really want it more. She says, Be careful because that's craving and that's something that you want to stay away from. And I said, well, Okay, well, how do you explain that? This is how they explained it. For example, in, in business, uh, we want a promotion and we say, well, we get, when we get a little bit more money, we're going to do better because I'm going to be able to buy this car or whatever. And then we get the promotion, we get the little bit more money, and then all of a sudden we want a bigger promotion, and then we want a better office, we want a corner office, and then we want the VP position, and then we want the executive vice president position. When is it enough? And, and if we don't get it, then, then they call it misery, right? We, we get misery. And so in order to evade misery, then you have to evade craving and you have to evade aversion, right? So craving and aversion were the things that we're really focusing on with the pain because what happens is uh, when we avoid pain, instead of looking at it objectively, then, or when we judge pain, instead of looking at it objectively. So let's take this back to our leadership journey. When we have someone that says uh, something mean to us say for example and immediately we say oh that was such a jerk or or he's such a mean person I don't want him on my team or maybe I'll just do something with this person instead of really looking at it objectively and looking at this individual with equanimity what they call equanimity hey Bill um, and so when you look at something or someone objectively uh, with equanimity when we are equanimous, then we're able to observe that person and, and take a look and say, well, wait a minute, they're new to this leadership journey. Maybe they're not able to make really quick decisions because they're observing. They really want to gather all of the data and they want to do a better job. And instead of judging them immediately and creating this misery within us, then we create a better, more equanimous life, a better life for us. So that was really, really um, interesting concept. And, and what was most interesting is how they had us utilize our own body to feel the things, good to see you too, Bill, to, to feel the things that we're feeling and and to really begin to understand the being laser like focused uh, in, in the, the, the again the smaller the area of your body that you focus on the sharper your mind becomes and that was kind of the the whole process so then the rest of the days so the first three days were all about clearing your mind then we went into the vipassana where where you start really feeling the sensations in your body all over your body and then really focusing on craving and aversion and 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 not not craving so much that it creates what they call misery and then not averting things that you really should be looking at equanimously so equanimity was a key to the entire training for the entire day uh, 10 days uh, uh, so then we started really focusing on every area of the body and they said eventually where we're gonna get to good morning Samantha thank you for joining uh, so eventually we're going to get to a place where we're gonna be able to actually touch with the tip of our finger any part of the body and be able to feel those sensations and feel the cells in your body vibrating now why do all of this in in what are the key learnings and um, what did I get when I came back to the office the learnings are very big so today I'm just gonna give a high-level overview and what I've decided to do is just do um, little vignettes so I'll be coming back on Saturday mornings and do little vignettes to to kind of walk you through okay what showed up for me this week for example when I got back to the office one of the things that I did um, 
uh, first was I had a meeting with my executive assistant Gloria and the first thing she noticed was that, that you know my phone was of course going off with a lot of texts from people everybody wanted to know what was this 10-day silent meditation about and I turned it over and I turned it off and turned it over and she said what are you doing I said well it's a it's a distraction I don't want to distract from our meeting she said oh my gosh Betty that's totally different in the past, you would have paid attention and you would have looked at it, you would have told me the story and we would have gotten diverted. So instead, I really was laser-like focused. I knew exactly where I wanted to go. We had the conversation and our meeting went very quick. So what I had heard about this was that it really helps your mind stay really focused, your meetings are shorter, your decisions are more sound once you think through the decisions because you learn how to think more and and I noticed that my conference calls were a lot shorter I got to the point a lot quicker um, and even yesterday there was something that happened uh, where uh, I was trying to get a hold of someone I had one of my senior executives trying to get a hold of someone they couldn't get a hold of them I ended up getting a hold of them but before then on, on LinkedIn my senior manager got a got a message from one of this person's people and said no thank you I'm not interested very rude and so when I got a hold of the CEO and actually made an appointment with the CEO I, I told uh, I told my employee I said you know what you should do and then I caught myself and I thought oh never mind I don't want you to do that he said well what are you talking about I said no we would have created something negative and I really don't want to create something negative and then uh, oh my gosh Ahmed how are you from Afghanistan good to see you anyway and uh, and so he said uh, what, did, what did you want to do and I said well I in the past I would have said go back into LinkedIn into this person's uh, employee and say thank you very much for your for your feedback uh, we've already connected with your CEO and we have lunch scheduled for next week now what would that have created something like that would have created something negative it would have created ill feelings and that's something that I I you know I'm not proud to share this uh, but I think it's a it's an incredible lesson for me personally um, in what other parts of my life have I been creating something like that where where you think oh my gosh I'm gonna tell that person that you know they didn't help me but somebody else helped me and, and what's my purpose in doing that so those are some of the things that I noticed Okay, let me tell you, let me finish by just telling you um, one more thing, and that was ignorance. Um, so we talked about craving, aversion, and ignorance, and I'm just, um, I'm keeping little notes to make sure that I don't forget to tell you something. Um, and so craving we talked about, it's not good to crave something because if you don't get it, then, you know, then then it's, uh, but but craving from a from a place of, uh, not wanting wanting something so badly that if you don't get it something that somebody else has hey Carol oh my gosh I haven't seen you for a while Greg Simonian hey how are you and Samantha um, and so so craving from a place of craving somebody else's job why didn't that person why didn't I get that promotion I should have gotten it I'm more qualified that kind of thing where you where you feel like envy for somebody else and you know even in the Bible it says envy is not good because you're craving something that somebody else has instead of being really happy you know I had a meeting with with somebody early this morning and Alicia and oh my gosh she's having an event on Friday in Los Angeles for those of you who are in LA I'm gonna post about that tomorrow with Alicia so stay tuned but I was just so happy for her she She's doing this women's conference and I've been thinking I want to do a women's conference I could have said oh my gosh why is she doing it but instead I was really happy for her that's what I'm talking about with craving right and then aversion we talked about aversion when we think about pain in and, and in the meditation when I was averting the pain the pain became even bigger and when I was actually looking at it objectively and we talked about equal equanimity in with equanimously then all of a sudden the pain went down and I was able to really look at it objectively so 
instead of judging people that do something that we maybe hurts us, uh, really looking at it objectively and taking a look at, okay, how is it that I'm going to look at this instead? And, and then ignorance is the other one. And I have a really good example. They said, you know, uh, you really want to focus on those three things, craving, aversion, and ignorance, and evading those things, and, and really getting those things out of your life. My Aunt Ruby uh, called me as I was going into the meditation. Actually, uh, I called her right back, and I, th and I thought, I better call her and let her know because I've never done something like this, and it's kind of crazy for somebody like me to go and meditate for 10 days silently, right? And so I got her on the phone, and she was crying like crazy. She said, I just don't want you to do this. You're going to go with this Buddhist and they're going to brainwash you and it's going to be horrible and I, you're a Christian and I just want you to continue to go to church. And I said, no, here, let me send you this link. It's Vipassana Meditation and look it up and it's going to be okay. It's really kind of a leadership thing for me and, and, it's, a, and it's a way of really honing my skills and, and, and training my brain to be more laser and to really focus on the things that are more important. Come to find out at the end of the meditation, I called her and she said, you know what? I'm good. I did some research. Now she's 86 years old, my Aunt Ruby. And she said, I went into Google. I Googled it. I did the research. And I, I, I know that it's, that it's, you know, it was started by the Buddhists, but it's not religious. And she's right. It wasn't religious. I was there with Christians, with people from Israel, people from China, people from uh, Iraq, Iran, from all over the place. And by the way, they don't even charge anything. It's just a nonprofit, so you donate at the end. Um, so let me walk you through. So those are the key learnings from this week. I'll come back next Saturday and tell you more and go a little bit more in detail on each one of the days and what happened. So let me finish with telling you what the, the day in the life was like. So in the mornings, I would wake up at four in the morning, take a five minute shower. Yes, I got down to five minute showers. <laughs> it was amazing, even in the showers, uh, uh, you could just see how you just begin to really be laser and, and you can do so much more with such less time. And then by 4.30, we were in the meditation hall and we meditated uh, from 4.30 till 5.30, either in our bedrooms or in the meditation hall. We had nice bedrooms that were small with our own bath or we shared a bath. And then, um, and then we, everybody came in with the teachers and we meditated um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Stillness is something that is uh, quite a challenge, Samantha, and it is incredible. Um, so, but I'll tell you the learnings anyway. And so everybody would come back to the room and meditate together, men and women. Now the men were held separate and the women were separate and, um, and we could barely just kind of see them, but we would come in and meditate. So all of us would meditate together. There were about 70 of us together. Um, and with the teachers and then uh, so that was 5 30 6 30 then at 6 30 was breakfast and volunteers would cook this incredible yummy um, meals and those of you who know me you know that I love a thick piece of steak uh, and it was all vegetarian food but it was so yummy and it was really healthy and I think the whole idea was just to cleanse our bodies again just like I told you at the very beginning you know you can't kill anything you can't lie uh, that's another thing that I noticed this week and I'll tell you about that in just a little bit and so uh, we went uh, to breakfast and then we got an hour and a half for breakfast and then we came back. And so we would do uh, one hour meditation with a break in between, like a five minute break, seven minute break, and then come back and meditate again for another hour. And then lunch was about an hour and a half. And again, lunch separate men and women. And then in the afternoon we would come back and uh, either meditate in our room or together and then we would all get together for another hour and then there were there were discourses dinner was about five o'clock and then uh, there were discourses at eight o'clock from eight to nine it was a one hour discourse on lessons and oh my gosh I couldn't take notes and I'm a note taker those of you who know me you couldn't take notes because they really wanted you to experience but I have access to the discourses and I did get permission to do these live videos and to share all of this um, they said as long as I, I I tell who the who the the materials came from I can actually share everything so I'll be sharing everything with you and again it's um it's Vipassana 
meditation. That's kind of the, the, the way you, you say it. Uh, so the discourses were amazing because they would teach us in the discourses in the evening from 8 till 9, this is what you went through today and how what you learned last night applies to life. Uh, when you're with your family, when you're with your employees, those of you who are executives, how you lead your companies is going to be different because you're going to lead it from a different place. Uh, and so every night we had a different discourse and there were so many nuggets that I decided instead of putting it all in one live feed because it's so much learnings and so many deep lessons, I'm going to actually put them in little um, vignettes so that you can get it. And, and I think... I'm going to do them early on Saturday morning because there are some of you from Europe that are watching um, and some of you from South America also that are watching and I want them in Canada. So I want to make sure that our time is um, is good so that you're, you, you're not able to miss it. Uh, lies. You can't lie. This is the last lesson that I actually learned. And uh, you know, I just finished a book on values, and so integrity is a very big thing for me. And so I caught myself. Uh, my ex-husband, uh, Juan Carlos, actually was the one that recommended this to me. And, uh, and he actually said, you know, I'm so committed to doing this, to you doing this, that I will actually do this with you. So he actually was there, even though we were completely separate and so forth, but he was there. And uh, people would say, so who did you come with? And I'd say, oh, my husband. And I'm like, no, 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 he's my ex-husband. And then I kept thinking, I can't lie. So I have to say exactly who he is. And, and yeah, and he's my best friend and I love him. And, and we have a great relationship, a great friendship. And, and, and so I just kept really thinking about being precise and being truthful. And isn't it interesting that I feel like integrity is such a big part of my life um, thank you, Samantha. Let me know how it goes. I'm glad you got the book, and uh, and so so you'll and you'll you'll see it in the book. There's a lot of stories about leaders from the White House and from the Pentagon and all of this stuff. And integrity was per, 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 permeated throughout the entire book, and it and it permeates through my entire life. The one thing I say to people is, don't lie. Lies and injustice are the thing that I just really don't stand for, and yet. I found myself that maybe I, I'd say it, but I push it a little. I say the truth, but I have to really think about, am I being completely precise? For example, in banking, uh, if somebody uh, brought in um, $10,589,000 to the bank, I will say, uh, you know, or 10 million, 800, then I'll round up and I'll say, ah, oh, they just brought about 11 million. Instead of saying 10 million, 500 or 10 million, 1100. Uh, so th this rounding errors leave wiggle room for uncertainty. And so your integrity could be questioned when you are not precise, when you are not telling exactly the truth you know if for example oh i'll try to make it you get an you get an invitation well i'll try to make it when you know you're not going to make it why create that that anticipation i'll try to make it so uh that piece was really big and, and there are a lot of other learnings anyway i've taken enough i think uh this just kind of gives you a high level overview of what i learned this week it's it's huge uh, I've already seen a lot of differences in my life as a result and I've only been back for one week so I can't wait to share more I'm gonna go deeper in each of the daily learnings uh, so for about 10 weeks I'll I'll do one one day each week of what was taught and what the lesson was and what how the practical application and how I actually um, learned learned from it so um, this was, uh, uh, Samantha was asking, where was this? This particular one, Samantha, was in um, Palm Desert, and it's a 10-day Vipassana, V-P-A, 
S S A N A meditation. Um, so it wasn't too far from here, but they have them all over the world. They have them in Northern California. They have them in Texas. There is an executive one that's coming up in Texas, and I'm going to recommend it to my executives and to people all around. Um, and they have them in India. They have them all over the world. This was started a long time ago, so I'll give more history. But this particular one that I just came back from was in 29 Palms. So, in, in, and for those of you who are not from the country, 29 Palms is in the desert which is uh, about a two-hour ride from here hey Nikki good to see you um, so so that was just about it um, thank you so much for joining let people know about it um, I my intention in, in doing these is to really share something that this nonprofit is sharing there is um, a little booklet that I the art of living and this book this little booklet talks about Goenka, S-N Goenka, G-O-E-N-K-A, and he's the one that came up with this technique. And he actually gave a talk in Switzerland. So if you want me to send this to you, I've scanned it. I, I'll be more than happy to send it to you. Just IM me or text me your um, your email address and I will send this to you uh, so just send me your email address and I'll send you uh, a scanned copy of this this is the best rendition of uh, the practical application and what it is hey Connie oh my gosh I love you to pieces it's so good to hear from you um, Connie introduced me to Bob Carr who is in my book and he just donated a million dollars so that we could uh, put 54 kids through college here in Southern California we're doing the the check uh, uh, the, the check uh, uh, publication or the check uh, giving um, in about a month sorry my piano just went anyway uh, good to see you thank you Connie I love you to pieces thank you Samantha Nikki uh, Mike uh, so many of you from all over that have joined us uh, thank you so much uh, love you dearly if you want a copy of this just you know I am me your email address and I'll send it to you. All right, have a super fantastic Saturday and I will talk to you next Saturday about the same time. Talk to you soon. Bye now.